Welcome to Bonga Lutheran. Um, I just have a couple of announcements, be announcements before we get started. Um, we have definitely canceled Memorial Day service for this year. And I am using uh, the Ascension Sunday scriptures, not the sixth Sunday of Easter out of John. Let's begin with a brief order for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. The closing paragraph in the Gospel of Luke leads us into an entirely new day. We are faced here with the close of the first part of Luke's story, the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the story of Christ's ministry on earth. This is the finish of that story, and the beginning of the story of the church. On the day of his ascension, Jesus leaves his disciples with a commission, a blessing, and a promise of the Holy Spirit. We begin by dealing with three lightning rods of our faith. Number one, 
scriptures. Two, the Messiah. And three, proclamation. The key to this passage lies in verse 45. Here, Jesus stands among his most faithful followers during his ministry on earth. His resurrection is now a sudden, wonderfully plain reality for them. And only then does he open their minds truly to understand what he has been teaching them. Almost from the beginning, that the Messiah must suffer and be handed over into the hands of sinners who will kill him. And then after three days, he will rise again. It is only at the very end of this part of the story, what amounts to be the first part of the story for the early church, that the disciples can begin to understand. And they can understand only because, as verse 45 tells us, the risen Christ opened their minds to understand the scriptures. It was a gift from God. The scriptures properly understood say that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. It is only right at the very end, which is really the very beginning, that Jesus opens the minds of his closest followers to understand the scriptures. They had to go through with him all that they have gone through to this closing slash beginning moment before the time was right for them to be introduced to the proper understanding of the scriptures. Jesus' followers did not begin with understanding of the scriptures. It began by following Jesus and to watch him fulfill every single messianic prophecy that was ever written about him in the Old Testament. They watched him suffer and die and rise from the dead. Very soon, with the Holy Spirit's help, they would come to understand what all these things meant. Now, Jesus was going to give them a new mission. Look what Jesus tells them in verse 48 in Luke. You are witnesses of these things. The same thing is repeated in Acts 1, verse 8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus wanted the disciples to do, to be witnesses. Their purpose now was to witness to the things they had seen and learned to other people. We have a variety of prints that we carry that make us witnesses to events, both heinous and holy, such as tattoos on survivors of Auschwitz, scars that both donors and recipients of organ transplants bear, fingerprints that help solve crimes, freeing victims from the fear they experience until the perpetrator is found. Those kinds of prints can be a witness to new life and freedom. The Messiah, the risen Christ, Jesus, did not come to call his followers to form a perfect little community for themselves in Jerusalem or anywhere. The disciples are not to receive the Holy Spirit and then turn inward upon themselves and form a perfect society that shines like a beacon to the rest of the world. We are often led to believe something along these lines. But what we're seeing here is not the case. No, the disciples are to go out into Jerusalem, not just to the temple, though they will begin there, but into all of Jerusalem. And now, we'll talk about the proclamation. They are to go out from Jerusalem and into all the world. And do what? Build schools and hospitals? No. Build community centers? No. 
Build churches? No, not that either. They are not first and foremost to take on any such projects, though they will, as it turns out, do all of them. But these projects, as right and good as they are, is not their mission. What the disciples are to do before anything and everything else, starting in Jerusalem and moving out into all the world, is to proclaim. Proclaim what? The Bible? No. True religion? No. Flawlessly reasoned theology? No. The Ten Commandments? No. A strict moral code? No. All of this and more will come out of the disciples' proclamation, but this is not first and foremost what the disciples are to be about. The disciples are to proclaim, to be sure, simply to proclaim. But what is it that they are to proclaim? Well, this, for a start, the Messiah. That the Bible, the scriptures properly understood, point to Jesus as the Messiah. And the Messiah is not some superhuman, angelic figure, untouched and untouchable, immune to human suffering and unswayed by death. No, God's Messiah, the God sent Savior, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the crowning representative of all humanity, men and women together, will suffer. Just as all women and men suffer, the Messiah will suffer as badly as any human will ever suffer. After suffering death, after dying just as we die, and after spending three days in a tomb, the Messiah will rise beyond and above death. The Messiah will conquer death itself by suffering and passing through death. The disciples are to proclaim that God, as another gospel says, did not send God's Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The disciples are to proclaim in the name of God's Messiah, in the name of the human one who was absolutely one with God, that God forgives. What the disciples are to proclaim is repentance, metanoia, turning around, turning back. What the disciples are to proclaim is a new day, every day. Repent, turn from the way that leads to nowhere, and follow the way of the Messiah. After talking with his disciples, Jesus performed one last visible miracle for them. He lifted up his hands to bless them, just as we do at the end of the service. And then he ascended into the sky, right before their eyes. And so what did those disciples do? We are told in verse 52 that they worshipped Christ on that mountain. And then they returned to Jerusalem, filled with a sense of great joy. They met with each other in the temple courts, praising God for the things they had heard and seen. Think about that. Before, the disciples would hide in their houses, afraid of the Jewish leaders. Now, we see them out in public, worshiping Jesus, filled with joy. They had just seen Jesus victoriously ascend to his heavenly throne. There was no doubt in their minds anymore that he was the God of the universe, the King of heaven and earth. If you're looking for a sense of joy in your life, a deeper, longer lasting sense of joy, look where the disciples looked. Look to Jesus. Sure, there will be times in your life when you are troubled. 
Life isn't always a bed of roses. But underneath that anger or sadness, you will find a layer of joy that the world can't take away. A Christian can say, I know God's not punishing me. All my sins have been taken away by Jesus. I know I am forgiven. I know that God will work this problem out. I know that God will give me the strength I need. This world isn't perfect, but I'm okay. There's a better world coming. That is Christian joy. The kind of joy you can't find anywhere else. God loves you, and your sins are forgiven. Amen. We are going to play uh, the Lord, You Give the Great Commission, just the first and the last verse, and it's on page 756 in the blue with one voice. If you want to, you can sing along. chose us to 
to be your witnesses in the world. We pray for the church in every place and the congregations in our community. Focus our hearts and minds on the ministry we share in your name. Tender God, we wait with hope for your presence to heal us, bless us, restore us, and give us peace. You know all the names of those suffering for whom we pray this day. Gentle God, you guide us as we seek wisdom. We pray for teachers, professors, theologians, daycare workers, and all those charged with teaching the young and old. Give them endurance and persistence in their valuable work. Infinite God, your inheritance given to all your saints is your presence in our life and in our death. We remember with thanksgiving the faithful departed, especially Conley Standage. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. People of God, let's not just stand here gazing into heaven as the disciples did after they saw Jesus leave. Instead, let's take up the mission Jesus left us to be his witnesses, to tell everyone we meet who Jesus is and how he has changed us and may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit 